because I want to talk about dolphins and share some amazing experiences I've had with, dolph with dolphins. Um, you may be, you, watch this dolphin right in front of you. You may think this dolphin is just uh, spinning and having some fun. This dolphin's actually watching herself play. That's right, she's watching herself in a two-way mirror. We can look through this glass and see her like we're looking through a window, but to her, it's a mirror. This is a two-year-old dolphin at the National Aquarium named Bailey, and I've been studying her behavior and the behavior of a lot of other dolphins. This dolphin has a sense of self. She understands it's herself in the mirror, and she's interested in watching herself. I'm gonna come back to this in a little bit. This is a thinking dolphin, conscious, aware, thinking. And she's a bottlenose dolphin, like the flipper variety of dolphin. And I've been thinking dolphin for about 30 years, thinking about the nature of dolphin intelligence and how we as humans, or how I as a scientist, can study the mind of a dolphin. How can we understand the mind of this other species that's so different from us? When we're looking at intelligence through our own human lens, it's a real challenge. But for the past 40 or 50 years, my colleagues and I have tried to understand the nature of their intelligence, and we know enough. We don't know much yet, but we know enough to know that these animals need protection. They need global protection in the world. And we know enough to put, I can say I know enough that I, I, mean, I feel reverence for these animals. Now, we're not the first to have recognized intelligence in these animals. The ancient Greeks, even back at the, in the fourth century BC, Aristotle and his colleagues recognized a glim, a gl that glimmer of intelligence in the eyes of the dolphins in the seas around them. And they've handed us down ancient myths and stories about dolphins showing empathy, something we've heard a great deal about today. Empathy is a characteristic we hold very dear to us, and we associate it with morality and intelligence and consciousness. And from ancient times, we've had stories about dolphins saving sailors who were drowning. We've heard about dolphins playing with children at the seasides in ancient Greece and many other countries. And these myths have been reflected on these coins, like the one you're looking at. And uh, again, we see dolphins on carrying uh, sailors, carrying people on many coins of many countries. I've had this wonderful opportunity to be up close and personal with individuals, individuals with personalities. They're not persons, but they're beings, just as much as we are, with real differences in their personalities. And I like to say I've had inc close encounters, not with ETs, but with other kinds of minds, remarkable minds, and all puns included, all puns intended here, these are non-terrestrials. Now, Seth talked to us about searching for extraterrestrials, and years ago I went to SETI, and I'd been friends with the folks at SETI, I've done some work with them, and I said, you know, we have some non-terrestrials with really big brains on our planet right here, and this would be a great testing ground for us to see how well we could do trying to communicate with another big brain. You can't get much more alien looking than a dolphin. I mean, take a look, they've lost in, in, in evolving to totally, uh, totally aquatic environment and in existence, these animals live in the seas 24-7. They've lost all these body morphologies, like different limbs, ear flaps, whiskers, that other animals have to communicate. They are exquisitely adapted to their environment, but very alien looking to us. Now, I just showed you a few animals. I showed you Bailey. This is Delphi, and here's Foster. They don't look like they have expressions necessarily, but when you get up and close to them and you know them as individuals, you read their body language, and guess what? They're reading our, lang our body language back, and we can communicate. Now, dolphins are complex in many ways. They have large and complex brains, and if you notice, there are a lot of folds in this dolphin brain. This is a lot of tissue packed into a brain, and their brains, like our brains, are packed with neurons. These are brain cells. Their brains are bigger than ours. They're about 1,700 grams as compared to our brains that weigh about 1,300 grams, but their bodies are larger than ours. So it's very hard to know 
what equates with intelligence. We don't know um, if it's the size of a brain that means an animal's more intelligent. It, it probably has to do with the size of a brain, how many neurons are in the brain, but also how that, those brains are wired up, how they're organized. So it's somewhat of a mystery. Nevertheless, we know that dolphins have the second largest brain relative to body size of any animal on this planet. But brains can only tell us so much. And it really is their behavior that really gives us an indication of what these animals, what their intelligence is like. And let me just share that these are complex societies in the seas. Dolphins live in complex social groups like we do, like chimpanzees do, like elephants do. They are true societies, and they cooperate with each other. They rely on each other for their survival. They share. They cooperate in mating. They show many different kinds of foraging or feeding strategies where they have to cooperate with each other. We have mothers, grandmothers, and their female infants that live together in three generations of animals living together. If it sounds familiar, it should, because we do things like this as well. We have extended families. And we have, we have females babysitting for other females' offspring. I hope these start, things start sounding awfully familiar, because it's a lot of what we do. Now, here's uh, some footage from a field site. I study dolphins in aquariums, but I also study dolphins in the wild. This is in Bimini, in the Bahamas. We take students out on field trips to understand what their behavior's like. You can hear their communication. They use a rich variety of sounds, as well as body language to communicate. And scientists like me and other colleagues of mine have tried to decode what dolphins are doing with their vocal communication. And we have not been able to crack the code. We don't have that magic decoder ring. We use c computers, and we're trying to use pretty sophisticated programs. But something's going on that we're just missing. We haven't cracked the code yet. Now, dolphins are creative and cultural creatures as well. It's, even though they're non-handed, they use tools. We used to think we were alone as a tool-using species, but dolphins, birds, some prime, other primates also use tools. Here's a dolphin in Australia that's learned to carry a sponge on her beak. That's the pointy part of their, their face to protect their beak from the, when they're foraging in rough, sandy uh, bottoms. And animals that live in smooth, that forage in smooth areas where they can't scuff up their beaks don't use sponges. And the dolphins, in only certain groups in these areas, use these sponges. So we, we're starting to get evidence for culture in dolphin societies. Now, here's a piece, clip of footage I want to share with you. This was from Ocean Giants, a piece just produced by BBC uh, this year. This is a dolphin off the coast of Florida kicking up the silt with her tail, or his tail, on the bottom of the ocean floor, making a circle and capturing fish by manipulating its own environment. And notice the other dolphins racing in to share the spoils. Cooperative feeding. They're manipulating their environment. They're using their environment. These are non-handed intelligences, non-terrestrials, non-terrestrial minds at work. Look at this ring. Bet you don't know where this one came from. This is not a toy we created for the dolphins. The dolphin creates this itself. This is Shiloh blowing a beautiful ring of air out of her blowhole. She blows the second ring. When it meets the first, it turns into a hoop, and she swims through it. <laughs> this was the first day I got my video camera 25 years ago. You can see how bad the video was, but look what I was able to capture. And they continued to create these beautiful silver rings of air. This was the first evidence we had for another species to create their own object of play. And it gave us the idea that they were capable of creativity in this way, as well as advanced planning. They would take a position at the bottom of their pool and produce these beautiful silver rings of air. And we've seen this in many different aquariums, and dolphins have their own styles. Here's another dolphin at the National Aquarium where I'm doing some research now. She's learned to blow the air out of her blow and kick it with her tail. It's a two-year-old dolphin, Bailey, again, and she's making these rings with her tail. I don't think I could have ever figured this out. She did this for over an hour and a half, and that says a great deal not only about their creativity, they're watching what they're doing, and they have this long period of tension. I could just let you watch this. This will go on for an hour. It says a lot about another kind of intelligence. So dolphins, 
again, show complex cognition or information processing as well. Now, we've heard several people today refer to looking at themselves in mirrors. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this, I showed you Bailey spinning in this mirror. And we think it's quite simple that we look at ourselves in the mirror and of course, that's my face. But in effect, this is a sign, this is an index, one index of a particular kind of self-awareness that we possess. The idea that we can see ourselves in a mirror and we understand it's our face, we have a sense of self, this sense of self. And we like to use the mirrors as tools to regard ourselves. In babies, this doesn't develop until about 18 to 24 months of age. And this is just the time when, they, when children also start showing the sense of empathy. Remember I mentioned that dolphins seem to be show empathy in, in saving sailors at sea? We hear reports of this in our, in, nowadays as well as sailors being saved, people saying they were saved by dolphins. Empathy and mere self-recognition seem to emerge in our species just about the same time when all these neurons are connecting up. Now, the ability to recognize oneself is not as simple as we think. It first requires that we pay selective attention to what's in a mirror. The mirror is just a reflective surface that has potential information in there, right? So first we have to pay attention to what's there, and most animals don't. How many of you guys have dogs or cats? Let's see your, some hands. Put your, put your dog or cat in front of a mirror. I don't think they're going to recognize it's themselves. They generally, they may look at you in the mirror, but they, it just doesn't seem to compute. So most animals don't pay attention to their own reflection. They don't understand that it's themselves. Once an animal looks in the mirror, if it's a human animal or a non-human animal, because guess what? We're part of the animal world. We have to interpret that information correctly to understand that it's us. And then once we interpret it correctly, we have to show the motivation to use the mirror as a tool and act like we're looking at ourselves in a mirror for us as scientists to understand that people have mirror self-recognition or other animals do as well. So this, this mirror self-recognition is an ability that we once thought was unique to just us. And then it was shown in the great apes. All the great ape species, uh, chimpanzees, bonobos, orangutans, and gorillas, our closest relatives also show mirror self-recognition. Well, this was challenging because people thought, well, the great apes show it because they're so closely related to us. And because I was so, uh, I had been working with dolphins for a long time, I thought, no, no, I think we need to look at this in dolphins. I think they have this ability as well. We used the same basic approach that's used for children and great apes. And this is what it's like to ask the question, can an animal show mere self-recognition? This is the basic approach. So first you expose a child, a chimp, or a dolphin to a mirror. They show three basic stages when you expose them to a mirror. First, they show exploratory and social behavior. So they may look around the mirror, try to look under it, behind it. Then they usually think that it's another dolphin, another ape, another child that they're looking at. That's that first stage. But then for those animals who, and humans who continue to figure out it's themselves, they show what we call contingency testing behavior. I'll show, Groucho is going to show us what this looks like. It's where the light bulb goes on. It's that recognition that when, you're, when you move a certain way, that critter in the mirror is doing the same thing. You learn that one-to-one, -one, there's a one-to-one -one relationship. So you get these highly repetitive, weird behaviors. And then once that light bulb goes on that you realize it's yourself, then you go on to show self-directed behaviors. You may look in your eyes, open your mouth, look at the insides of your mouth, watch yourself doing things at the mirror. And then finally, scientists will put a mark on different parts of one's body, of the animal's body. And the question is, will they touch the mark if they have hands where they're marked when they're at the mirror? rather than touching the mark of the, the animal in the mirror. In the case of the dolphin, they didn't have hands. They don't have hands. So we said, would a dolphin, when marked, race to the mirror and orient that part of their bodies that's marked to the mirror right away? And they did that. So dolphins, in fact, did show mirror self-recognition. Here's a dolphin, Presley, that we studied at the New York Aquarium, doing the Groucho bit, the contingency testing bit. He is figuring out that it's himself in a mirror. Now he's marked on his head. And you can see a faint mark on his head. And he's orienting his head in a way to bring that mark. And now you're into, in front of the mirror. And now you're seeing some really unusual dolphin behavior. 
He's looking at himself in the mirror. This dolphin has something in mind. Now, here's, here are the dolphins in their outdoor pool. They're getting marked, Presley's getting marked under his chin area now. He's gonna show a different behavior when he's being released from the mark. There are two dolphins. The dolphin at the far end was marked, the other one wasn't. And the dolphin that's marked, Presley, races down, and now he's stretching his neck and exposing that part of his body that's marked. And you can see him stretching his neck. So this is a dolphin showing mere self-recognition. Now, I'm gonna step over this red line, this carpet, because I stepped from science, and I'm still working in science, but I stepped out of doing just science into advocacy. And the reason I did this is right after I did this study that was published in the National Academy of Sciences showing dolphin mere self-recognition, I heard that dolphins were be being killed in certain parts of the world. In Norway and Japan, we still kill flipper. We still kill these very dolphins that I had been studying for 30 years. And I felt that I had to do something about this. How could I not? Wouldn't you want to do something about it if you heard they were getting slaughtered? They're slaughtered because in Japan in particular, the government thinks they're competing with fishermen for fish, and that's just not the case. It's not the case. I'm just going to show you a clip of the film The Cove. When I found out about this, this is an award-winning film. How many of you have seen The Cove? It reported this dolphin killing in Japan. When I found out about it, I knew I had to do something to stop it. This is very graphic, but we've got to see it. We had to show the world what was going on. We could not break the story in the media. And um, what I've been working on is getting scientists, I'll stop here. I've been working on getting scientists and zoo and aquarium professionals professionals and environmental groups and animal welfare and animal rights groups all saying the same thing. This needs to stop. Science has a loud voice, or at least it should. We can take our science and everything we know about dolphin, dolphin intelligence, dolphin empathy, and show a little empathy back. We have to have our science informing public policy. And I think it's really critical, and I'm saying it with a really loud voice, and I'm screaming it now. Our scientific knowledge needs to transcend cultural and geographic boundaries. What we find in our science in the United States or England or, or Australia has to translate across boundaries. We all have to be citizens of the world. Now again, this idea of citizens in the world is not a new idea. Let's go back to the ancient Greeks. Diogenes, a fourth century Greek philosopher. Diogenes was the philosopher in the tub. Remember Diogenes? He actually coined the term cosmopolitan. Sounded like a contemporary term to me. Fourth century Greece. And he said, I am a cosmopolitan. I'm a citizen of the world. I inhabit the world. I'm a citizen of the world. I'm a cosmopolitan. Raise your hands, because we're all citizens of the world. How many people feel like they're citizens of the world here? So what I'm going to ask you today is to work with me, to work with me and my colleagues, and join us in our voice. I want you to all be thinking dolphin. Be thinking dolphin. You heard about what dolphins are capable of. You heard about dolphins being empathic about their intelligence. We are not alone. We're ending the long loneliness. We have non-terrestrial intelligence on our planet that we can relate to, and that's relating to us. Think about this picture. I want you to leave here thinking dolphin. Help me spread the word. Words, ideas are important. They replicate. Think dolphin. Be thinking dolphin. Think about what you heard. These are the drives. They're continuing today. We can stop these dolphin drives. We can go viral with our ideas. Spread the word. Tell people what you've learned today. I want you to leave here thinking dolphin. Thank you.